Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Luer. I'm excited to have Mr. Seven Falbone on the phone with me here today. Welcome to the podcast, Seven. Hey, Marcus. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Or good evening. Yeah, good evening. It's good evening for me here from Bangkok and uh, very early morning for you. Uh, I'm sorry, where, where am I calling you from again? Redondo Beach, California. You're in another California. I've, I've had plenty of California calls here lately, so uh, um, really good to see you there. Um, and before we get started, uh, let me sort of quickly introduce you to everyone. Uh, and I think the simplest uh, description of yourself would be a singer, a songwriter, record producer, turned entrepreneur and fund manager. Um, and now in the, in the true subculture world, uh, bringing all the parts together in the different companies you've worked with. And, and that's really what we're going to be digging into um, of how all these parts from your early career in the music space to then, you know, esports and of course some parts also in the real world of sports all come together here um, and your own entrepreneurial journey in between. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing those interesting stories there. But um, how did you get started? I mean, I think at heart you are an artist, right? You're a musician, uh, you're, you're a singer. Tell us a bit about that. Sure. Yeah, music is uh, is my first passion. You know, I I, I think uh, as an early uh, child, I had a house full of siblings that, that were much older than I am. Um, and uh, my closest sibling was 10 years older than me. Uh, I had three sisters who used to uh, treat me like a doll and make me sing all the time um, with them. <laughs> right. And uh, and then my, my parents wound up moving from, from the city. We lived in the Bronx, New York, up to a, a dairy farm. And four of my siblings, well, th- I'm sorry, three of my siblings stayed, stayed behind because they were much older. And I went from having a house full of people to living alone with cows on a farm, literally. Okay. And I would just spend my days writing music and, and making up songs. And that became a passion of mine. Um, and, and as I grew older, I wanted it to be a career. And I spent uh, a lot of time in New York City, uh, playing in all the clubs and, and trying to get signed. And, and uh, eventually, you know, was signed by Ahmed Erdogan and, and Craig Kalman and Valazoli to Atlantic Records. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, I I went to uh, Spotify earlier and and listened to a couple of your songs, and I mean, I would describe it a bit as sort of Western country music uh, style, or what, how would you describe it? Yeah, well, I I had a I had a few different. Um kind of iterations as an artist my, my when i was signed to atlantic i was in a pop rock band called seven in the sun and we had some charted uh, success there um and then uh later on i i launched a band called whiskey falls um which which was kind of like a, a a modern day eagles it was a country harmony group at the end of my life when i take that journey all along Cool. Now, you then obviously, you know, sort of turned from being an artist into an entrepreneur, right? And, and your four, I think, you know, one of your, your first early successes in business was a company called um, We Three Kinks. Uh, and I'm sure there's a meaning behind the name there. Um, talk about us, you know, what you guys were doing and how you were creating, you know, music and IP um, and in the different genres you were working at that time. Sure. Um, yeah, We Three Kings was uh, was an amazing part in my life. Um, I started with, uh, with two of my closest friends. They happen to be twin brothers. Um, and uh, and uh, the reason I bring that up is their names were Walter and Bill. Uh, my birth name is Keith, and, and, and we were building our first studio, or wrote our initials in the, in the ground, WKB, and the B looked like a three, and it came up We Three, W Three K, which um, we thought We Three Kings. And, uh, you know, essentially, when, when the company was started, when I was at Atlantic Records, it was an amazing time. Um, and, you know, with the AOL Time Warner merger had just happened, which was supposed to revolutionize the world. Mm-hmm. And and really bring together film and 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 music and and technology and the internet, but it was a little early. You know, we really didn't have the iPhones then, and and the, the companies didn't have the right cultures working together. Right. Um, it kind of gave me my first glimpse at what's happening from from a cultural side, and 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 also um, or corporate side, and 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 also Napster came out, which was yeah. like this amazing thing that happened where there was this incredible disruption in a, in a in an industry that had been around for for a very long time. Yeah. And um, I, I, at that moment in time, I kind of became like a secret futurist. I kept thinking, well, what's what's going to be disrupted next by technology, right? Mm. And, and I also started to think about 
almost uh, uh, in, in a way of, of how can we get music out to people um, in, in different ways? And this was, you know, maybe 1999, 2000. Um, and I remember going to Valazzoli at the time, who was, you know, chairman at, um, at Atlantic and talking about Casio coming out with their excellent camera and uh, and all the marketing dollars they were going to spend. And I had mentioned, you know, doing something, you know, trying to think of something creative maybe to do with like a Kid Rock's record who was coming out. And he said, you know, we don't we don't pair our artists with brands like that. You know, I said, well, what if I did what if I did something for myself like that? And he said, nobody knows who you are, Seven. I don't care what you do. You know, <laughs> and, and Val was a great guy. He had a great personality and he was such a great mentor. And um, and, uh, you know, we wound up striking a deal with Casio um, doing a. Uh, uh, a, a market analysis of all the radio stations that we were going to go to and, and the reach that we were going to have. And then they wound up paying us, you know, for performance to take this little excellent camera out of our pockets and, and take a picture of people while we were on stage. Cause it was so mm. small, we could forget it was in our pocket, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that was really my first foray into understanding that brands you know, needed to reach an audience. And, um, and, and then we, we had done a, a, one of our songs, Walk With Me, um, which was a hit, was, was licensed uh, by, by a movie. I think it was uh, America's Sweethearts with Julia Roberts. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I just found that really fascinating. They were paying us additional money. I was learning as I was going, you know, I was, I was really young. And, and again, you know, there were, there were eyeballs there. And then we started to do television shows. And, and We Three Kings became, um, you know, we were on the road and, and, and started to literally call NBC and CBS and ABC Fox and say, hey, you know, we've got a hit song on the radio. We'd like a chance to write one of your theme songs or to be involved in music in some way. Mm. And um, – and because we knew we wanted to have a, a bigger audience reach. And at that time, you know, television, you know, to be in prime time, you know, I think you had 18 million yeah. people, you know, or something like that. Right. And um, and we got really lucky. Um, we, we, we got a couple of different pitches. And within a, within a month's time, we had written uh, the theme song for The Simple Life with Paris Hilton, which was like one of the first very big reality shows mm -hmm. uh, we we. One of our songs was chosen uh, to be the the theme song for the John Wall Show, which is a five day a week talk show, mm. and uh, the other one uh, uh, became a band that we produced and wrote um, became the theme song to a, a Fox scripted show called True Calling. And all of a sudden, we were in, you know, the film and television business. You know, uh, aside from being in the artist business. Right. So for we with We Three Kings over a ten year period, we created a twenty thousand piece library. And wow. serviced, you know, some of the biggest television shows. Um, and and one of the things I, I really learned from that was, you know, b because it was the birth of reality television, we we had a they weren't paying a lot of money for the music and not enough for us to sell it to them. Right. And so we said, look, you know, we'll make the music for the television show anyway and right. uh, and we'll keep it. Right. So right. a lot of people agreed to that. And so we just went out with a bunch of other composers and started to make a massive amount of music. And and to this day, you know, we still have that catalog is, in, you know, Extreme Home Makeover, uh, um, Dance Moms, uh, m m many hit shows that are still, you know, on the air or re-airing in other parts of the world. Right. And you get royalty on the back of it. Yeah, I like that. Yes, and and I th and I think that's a bit of a theme across uh, the, your career, right? It's it's all about IP creation, right? And I know you've done a few things in the world of sports as well, uh, uh, with with some MLB teams, uh, you know, and and so talk a bit about that because uh, that that's a really interesting part as well. Yeah, you know, I I think I've always had this fascination, you know, in in how you connect with people's passions. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, uh, when you're first born, the, the, the first thing, the first time you're marketed, right, is your, your family, whatever religion they are, you know, they, they, you know, bestow upon you, uh, the belief system that's in your family lineage. And the second thing they put, put on you is, their favorite sports team, right? So you're, you're, if, if your dad is a Yankees fan, you usually grow up to be a Yankees fan. And, yeah, and, and those passions are so run so deep. And um, I remember just going to a, a sports game and, and listening to We Will Rock You play in the stadium. I said, man, I, I would love to have one of my songs play in a stadium like this. Right. Um, and as we were doing all this custom music, you know, we, we had the opportunity. We wrote a song called Load Up the Bases. Mm -hmm. And uh, Load Up the Bases wound up becoming uh, a baseball anthem. Right. Uh, the Red Sox used it the year they won the World Series for the first time in a while. Um, and then it, it many other teams uh, started to chart, I think, for a couple of years in a row during during the playoff time. And the Atlanta Braves wound up um, having a version of it as their theme song. It won an Emmy for Fox Sports South. And then 
I had the great opportunity to work with a, a really brilliant uh, gentleman by the name of Gary Reynolds, uh, who is GMR. You know, he, he started and founded GMR. And Gary, you know, uh, has a love for music as well. And uh, I consulted for Gary and, and, and them. And we created about 20 theme songs and for the Dallas Cowboys, for the Texas Longhorns, you know, the Green Bay Packers, I mean, you name it. Um, so reinventing you, music. When you say theme songs, these are like the official theme, song, uh, theme music or, or what are they particularly used for? Like so, the yeah, team the walks in or walks out or whatever, in between the half times or when are they, when are they playing these things? So multiple different uses and different experiences. Uh, some of them were, were, were theme songs that when they came out on the team, some were used for special purposes if they scored a touchdown or, okay. or um, you know, the, the real exciting one I think was, you know, in the Green Bay Packers, we came up with a, a, a song called G-Force because uh, in, 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 in the Packers stadium, you know, they, they talk about the 12th man when it's, it's that other player on the team, but is yeah. the, the fans in the stands. Right. And, uh You know, Gary had this you know great idea, and we and we and we worked with him to to uh, create this song. And every time the Packers came out, they raised the G Force flag to in, ignite the the fans. And and that year that that song launched, um, they the, the Packers won the Super Bowl, uh, and uh, it was really exciting. They used that song a lot, and uh, I think they still That's use it cool. in the stadium today. That's very cool. Yeah, I love that. And, and so again, it it goes along the scene here we were talking about earlier, right? It's creating IP, which It has a very long shelf life, right? And in theory, it could be used forever, right? As long as, I guess, the team likes it and, and maybe if it helps them win it, uh, you know, that, that it will be played there. Uh, that's really interesting. Now, how did that then sort of lead into your next part of your career, right? Um, you know, you, you ended up uh, as a consultant at, at several groups there. Um, what was sort of the, what was the path there, you know, moving in from, uh, from again, building IP, but now you're going into the next level here? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when Napster had come out, I, I, I really kind of became this secret kind of a futurist and, and was kind of always looking at what was going to be next. And um, there was a time in my life where I literally would get off a tour bus and then go fly to Huntsville, Alabama, because I was meeting with companies that were building technologies there that were used in, for, for government agency use and, and, and working with them, thinking about how to commercialize them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, That was that was an exciting time. I got to meet some great engineers. I got to meet some great designers, um, and uh, it, it just opened up my spectrum of 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 people that I knew. and And I was always just constantly learning. And through that, you know, when when you're looking at leading technologies, you know, you're you're you're. Uh, I, I think your 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 thought process on the world begins to change because you know you're not just living in what's happening now. You're thinking about what's happening, you know, next. And and as a result, I, I developed some some really strong insights um, on on how to help companies and 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 look at what was around the curve. Uh, and so I built the technology there, uh, and I had this uh, amazing uh, UI UX designer named Mirko Pasquale. Pasqualini, who was in Italy, who, you know, we helped bring to the United States, States uh, Mirko uh, built and designed the Nike Plus platform um, yeah. and uh, worked with Mirko to build um, a, a company called TwitYap, which was, uh, you know, uh, it was a video loyalty uh, and consumer platform, which we wind up selling to um, a publicly traded company called Exhibit, which uh, was a part of Sky Mall and Sky Mall Ventures. And while I was there, um, After they acquired the technology, I started to consult for the company mm. um, and uh, wound up finding I had a knack for, for business development and for looking at strategic pieces of the disparate parts of the company. And uh, I started to really have fun with that. And uh, it, it, I, I, I was – Not that I was losing my passion for music, I just you know had been doing it for so long. And the difference between being a recording artist and 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 making music for film and TV is one is more factory like. Um, yeah. And and I I had just kind of transitioned into a different place in my life. And with Exhibit, you know, we had some amazing you know customers like you know General Motors and 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 and, and built you know uh, apps you know for them and technology for them for all their dealerships across the nation. And um, uh, one of the one of the folks who bought my Technology, who was a, a founder in that pubco, uh, was a young gentleman by the name of Brian Love. Um, Brian um, 
and, and I just really hit it off. We just saw the world the same way, and we decided to start a consulting company called Pushpoint Management Group. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we we the, the whole thought process was people the world was moving digital. You take your finger, you put it down on your phone, and, and you would get whatever you want. And we wanted to help companies, you know, through that transition of reaching their consumer. And you know, we started to work with public and private companies. Uh, we worked with Zenga on uh, Words with Friends and 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 building out you know competition with them. We worked with ESL, uh, mm. which is well, which is really you know how I started to work with ESL the first time, um, and went from being you know an outside consultant to you know a senior executive advisor working with uh, the chairman Steve Roberts and the board there. Yeah, tell tell us a bit more about uh, ESL because uh, you know we're going to go back later and talk more esports anyway. Um, and ESL, of course, anyone in esports would know huge player uh, out of my hometown, Cologne, actually. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, I know the I know some of the founders. I've been to their office. Uh, they're they're cool guys. Um, but what what were you doing with them? And again, I know I know this. I know it obviously. But uh, tell us, uh, tell the the listeners. Sure. Um, yeah, ESL was just an amazing, amazing experience, and and uh, and and it really kind of brought together uh, a lot of things from my past and my history, um, and uh, to to kind of help me define where I was going to go in my future. Um, you know, I had the great opportunity to work with a gentleman named Ed Tomasi there, um, who's one of our, you know, founding partners in Subnation. Um, mm-hmm. Steve Roberts, Craig Levine, Ralph Reichert, um, uh, Han Park, and and the my 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 mandate was was two things. One was to bring in non-endemic brand strategies uh, and and work with non-endemic brands to bring them into the space because we really hadn't had any at that point. Um, and the other was to really look at this from a music and cultural aspect and see where the gaps were. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really funny, you know, we talk about sports. I remember back then going to Adidas um, in Germany and working with the futures division there and setting up a meeting with, with, with Ralph and Craig Levine, who coincidentally now are both the co global CEOs. Um, And, and the, Adidas was was struggling at that moment in time because they were like, wait a minute, these are esports. I mean, they're not athletes. You know, our, our number right. one mandate is athletes. I mean, this isn't this isn't a sport, right? right? And now, if you fast forward to today, COVID, you know, esports is the only sport right now, <laughs> and right. and um, and it's actually becoming you know uh, uh, you know a pillar to many of the major brands, uh, you know, and their strategies. Um, but at ESL, you know, we we did some really amazing things. Um, we wanted to you know taking from what I. No, one of the first things that we wanted to do was create an anthem and see how it would relate to the fans. And um, we had created a, um, a song called My Story, um, uh, which is a really great song. And uh, we, we launched that at Katowice uh, in 2016 as an official theme. And, and, you know, that song played one time in the stadium. There was no real marketing. We had a little Easter egg of, um, of a Spotify link out there. And, and, and the song got over 3 million Spotify plays, you know, from, from a single use. And then the NFL licensed it um, for for their training camp. And, um, and, and it was really amazing to me because, you know, all the time I had spent previously trying to get music on television because there was a lot, large audience in prime time, you know, there, there was this disproportionate um, – thing happening with with brands and their spends that i was noticing because at esl you know we were getting 20 million people in a stream and it was at that time it was difficult to get brands to put their money into those streams and and we had their ip addresses right Right. on television it had declined maybe to two million people in prime time and and there was you know an overspill of brands in the market right and you have no idea who's who's watching (laughs) uh, no (laughs) idea exactly we have no data no data. And so I knew then I was like, well, this is really interesting because, you know, with all the work I had done in television, the light bulb started to go off in my head saying, you know, this isn't going to last because none of these kids that we have are watching TV. You know, they're all connected digitally. And and this is going to create a disruption, uh, which is my favorite place in the world, because when there's disruption, there's opportunity. Right. right? And and um, and I also saw you know, I was one of the first people to to recognize that you know esports, as big as it is, it's still a small business. And and I, I started to compare it to hip hop, right? Mm. Um, and I I, uh, I I saw that the 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 connection between hip hop and esports very clearly because the influence that the esports celebrities and 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 teams had, you know 
was tremendously authentic. Um, but but the, the revenue that was there, and even still, I think esports still struggles in that a, a, a little bit today. But the lifestyle and culture aspect of it, I knew was going to be tremendous. And um, and and so we really started to focus on when when we would do did go back to Adidas and say to them, look, you know, the, the lifestyle of esports and the culture of esports is, sports is actually going to be bigger. We felt, right. you know, the, the ability to put limited edition sneakers, you know, I mean, this is very early on before, before anybody was doing it, we were in these conversations. Um, and, uh, and, and that really became my passion. The other thing that became my passion when I was at ESL was, you know, we started to see brands start to come into the space. And when they came into the space, they came into the space with their big giant agencies who were doing the things that they traditionally knew how to do, you know, buy Chiron's lower thirds, put their logo everywhere. And, and and this audience, you know, that, like that, that. ESL, they don't <laughs> like that. They don't want to be marketed to. And, you know, they, they're exactly. gamers. You know, we, we want a game. You know, we want to play games. We, we don't want to be interrupted with a logo in a commercial. Correct. So, you know, uh, you know, we really understood that that was going to be an issue. And so, you know, uh, myself and some other folks, you know, Ed Tomasi being one of them, started to, to really think about, you know, what was that going to look like next? And how could we create a safe landing, most importantly for the gamer, but also for the brands and investors who were going to go into the space? Because it, it started to feel like a gold rush where everybody was like, I'm going to go into esports and I'm going to make a, you know, a ton of money. And, you know, you know, a, a, as of today, there have been very few people who've actually really been able to 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 generate cash out of it although i i really think we're we're only in the first inning of of esports uh and gaming and 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 you can totally see how how quickly it's growing and and that it's going to be here to stay for a long time absolutely and, and i think we both know i mean there's a big difference between e-gaming and esports right i mean e-gaming is a 150 billion dollar industry and there are plenty of folks make plenty of money there Esports, which is a billion or you know whatever, when you read it uh, around that number, um, yes, there is money. A billion is is nothing. Uh, it's not a small amount, but it it is spread over a lot of folks. And yes, there's still not that many who make a lot of money there, right? Um, a lot, you know, including ESL. I mean, at least the stories I know, you know, they've they as as all the amazing things they do, turning it truly into a you know real cash cow hasn't maybe quite happened yet. But uh, they're on the right track, even after you know ten years and plus they're in there. Oh yeah, ESL is an amazing company. They got amazing backers, and I, I think ESL is going to be one. Of, you know, they're so rooted in the authenticity that they will be one of the companies that really endures. You know, and and I I think you know, I, but you know, when when you talk about you know the the profitability, the, my my thought process was you know. Where's the IP? Again, you go back to you, to what you know, right? Mm. And a lot of times in, in esports, it's the publisher that owns the IP, Correct. right? Which is it, which makes it difficult for other people, and they can they can change the rules of the game. Um, they do. You look at Overwatch <laughs> League and, and 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 others, you know, and, and and it becomes difficult. So you know, being able to um, have the the trust of the community um and and the understanding of, of what they need is is really important to to building a footprint there right and that's a great segue into obviously you know without jumping over some of the other things you've done in your career but uh, i'd love to start talking a bit about where, where you're now right and and i think you're, you're in an interesting uh uh, environment there, which has both, um, I guess, sort of a private equity arm almost, or, or you know, venture part to it, and then of course you're building um, Subnation, which is really you know the subculture which has been talking about from music to esports and 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 and, and even sports in that sense, um, all kind of coming together. So talk about both parts a bit. Uh, let's start with what Subnation is and what are you, what you guys are building there. Um, and then we'll talk about the, maybe the holding a bit about some of the exciting things you're doing in, uh, in, uh, big block capital. Sure. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I was doing, a. uh, running a special P&L project for ESL one in New York. Um, we had done a, a deal with fuse television and we had, you know, a special performance with a Columbia artist and team liquid actually. Um, and, uh, and I, I had the opportunity to meet a gentleman, uh, through a friend of mine at that event. Um, uh, not at the event specifically, but during the event, I went out to, to meet him and, um, is, is he ran a, uh, uh, the largest auto dealership out of New York. 
and uh, he'd been in the auto industry for about 40 years um, and just an amazing guy who was using technology um, and making technology investments to keep his dealerships you know, at the, at the top of their game. Mm-hmm. And over the course of 40 years, he had invested in multiple different um, technologies and companies and probably about 40 or 50 companies. And um, And he was looking for someone to help him with his investments. Something that had always been a passion of mine, something I thought, well, you know, I never went to school for finance. I'll never get to do that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and we just made a great connection. The gentleman's name was Bruce Bendel. And uh, I, I remember, you know, sitting with Bruce and just thinking, wow, what, what a wonderful guy this is. I couldn't believe, you know, with, with all he had accomplished and done, how how humble and down to earth he, he was. He, and um, he is, he is. yeah, he's a true. Yeah, you guys are in YPO together. Yeah, aren't that's you? right. Yeah, I know Bruce well. Yeah. And and um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, we did a little test, you know, we started to work on a couple of things that he had. And, and I really got to see him in a place where, you know, the, the two the two projects that we were working on were not in a good place. And I saw how he handled himself, you know, um, during those times. And I just thought, wow, this guy just has an impeccable composure and, and he's got such an incredible heart. And I said to my wife at the time, I said, Larry, I really, I really want to work for this guy, you know, and I was at ESL. The ESL was an exciting place to be, you know? Right. Um, and so, you know, we, we agreed that I would come in and, and we would start a family office and, and, you know, kind of organize um, the investments that they had. And he had some interesting things. He had an artificial intelligence company that was housed on the, the, on the, on the campus in Princeton. Um, he had a, a, a marketing company that was doing all the, like the biggest sports graphics packages in the world for, you know, and, and MLB, NBA, uh, FIFA, ESPN. Um, and so, so what we did was, I came in. We, we founded the family office, and I took over the CEO role of that um, of the sports media company. And and we said, look, we're gonna we're gonna do a few things. We're gonna use this this creative company, um, which right now is a service business, and we're gonna turn it into an IP business. And we're gonna we're gonna create a bridge for brands and a safe landing for brands who are already making commercials and doing campaigns for. Um, through esports, and we're going to build a company called Subnation. At that, at that moment in time, we created a good lever agreement for Ed Tomasi to leave ESL. He came over as a founding partner. Um, we also said, look, if we're going to do this, we need people who really know how to speak to brands better than anybody because this is about brand trust. And I was very lucky to be introduced to a gentleman who I just, you know, admire and respect so much, Doug Scott. Um, who is, uh, you know, the founder of the Red Herring and the Hollywood Stock Exchange and, um, and, and, you know, Ogilvy's branded content division and, you know, sat with Doug and, and, you know, we had you know a bunch of meetings and we just really aligned on our vision of the world. He's another futurist and, and Doug and Ed and myself and, and, and the family office, you know, decided to, to create this, this, this company called Subnation. And, and, and before we really launched it, it was more of a concept at first for a while, because we were just working through how we wanted to position our ourselves. A lot of people were rushing in and buying teams, and we knew a lot of that was not going to work out well. Uh, a lot of people were rushing in and, and building big venues. And, you know, when, when, when you're responsible for putting seats, you know, in, in a stadium, you know, one time a year when you're doing a big event, you know, the folks at ESL know that better than anybody. The thought of doing that on a daily basis, you know, is, yep. is complicated because gamers want to stay home and game, right? They don't want right. to, they don't want to go out all the time. And, and so we, we, we created this thesis of, of what Subnation would be. And, and, and we had another, you know, amazing gentleman by Tom, by the name of Tom Flanagan, who is one of our other co-founders, who's now uh, one of the heads of programming o- over at Hearst. Um, and, um, and so, uh, you know, we started to do some tests. Our first test was we became the cultural content partner for, um, E3, um, mm-hmm. in 2018. And, uh, in, in that time we, we set up a, a place where where music and fashion and and technology and gaming could 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 all fit. And we had Josh Hart from the Lakers there. Dead Mouse came. Little Yachty before he was a part of Phase Clan. We had Myth, um, who's the number two gamer in the world at that time, oh. all coming and hanging out in our section. Uh, we we had done um, brought VW into the space for the first time, and that was an interesting integration because they, you know their agency had thoughts about how they wanted to be positioned, and and we simply said, look, just 
just show up at E3 as a, as a canvas. Let's bring you in as a canvas. And, and we brought in Marvel. And so uh, Marvel brought in one of their leading artists um, who painted on the car in real life. And it became wow. one of the, 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 the largest global viral um, social campaigns for VW in their history. Uh, just people coming up and taking a picture with the artist next to the car and being engaged, very authentic. Mm. Um, and then we wound up hosting a, like an after party with E3. Uh, Dead Mouse performed. We, we found... Um, uh, gosh, what was his his name? Young Blood, uh, who was more of a rocker that people didn't think would fit with the esports audience. But we had a million people in our first stream. Uh, we had a sold out show at the Novo Theater, and it really was the birth of wow. This is how we bring together um, streetwear. We had streetwear artists there painting. You know, this guy Kickstarter is customizing sneakers. You know, we had mm. uh, Volcom there, Vans, um, and 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 we really brought it together. And that was kind of the birth of subnation. And since then, you know, we, we have been, um, we have been slowly, systematically taking on municipalities, taking on brands, taking on real estate developers, um, building a, a slate of content that we feel an IP uh, that we feel is going to be very, very relevant. And uh, we're, we're just getting ready to come out of, of uh, I would say, an incubation stage into uh, full force right now. And there's a lot of exciting things happening there with Subnation. Well, to, to maybe summarize it, what's, what is the current? the current platform, right? What, what would, how would you describe it um, in the simplest sense for someone who has never been to it? So, yeah, Sub Subnation right now, what we feel we're building is, you know, the Disney of, of esports and gaming. And what I mean by that is we focus on uh, – municipalities, live events, physical spaces, um, not so much that we own, but that we curate. Um, so we're, we're partners with the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, um, and, and we've helped them to be in the esports and gaming space, although Epic was you know in the city. Uh, Ed Tomasi has really led the charge on that and just done some incredible work with the city. Uh, as a matter of fact, we helped them uh, bring uh, Rainbow Six, uh, working with Ubisoft to bring Rainbow Six to that market for, uh, for their Rainbow Six World Championship partnered with ESL on that and really had tremendous economic impact. Uh, Forbes wrote about um, just what we were doing in the region and the market. And, and now we're on, a, uh, on an ongoing partnership with the city, um, the Board of Tourism, working out um, uh, ways to, to build not just not just esports, but gaming and technology and, 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 and thoughtfulness into the region, which then turned into us doing that for Waterloo, Canada and Kissimmee in Orlando, Florida. And, uh, and, and recently, you know, we've, um, uh, this, this is, uh, about to be announced, uh, working with, uh, a major, um, brand Atari hotels, uh, for the launch of, of the Atari hotels, the hotels. Yeah, that going I was to just going to ask about it because I mean, obviously we, we've had some conversation about it. So, uh, so talk, talk a bit about Atari hotel. I love this. I mean, you know, we've done stuff in branding, what I call branded real estate, uh, you know, with brands like Amani and, and, and sports brands as well, uh, creating this. So. I love that. I know we're going to talk some more about it in the future, but uh, what is the Atari Hotel about or, or what is it? What, what, how can people visualize this? You know, first off, Atari is just such an amazing brand. I think, you know, anybody who's ever played video games, you know, has such a, you know, a, a gratitude to pay to them. Uh, um, they, they, they've, they've really, when I think back about my childhood or, or, or playing just Atari, you know, I, I remember having a system and, and, and it just, it just brings back such a nostalgic space, but it's also Atari is a brand, you know, now that's really thinking about the future as well. And the Atari hotels are, are, are really a place where, where gamers and, 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 and families and community can come to experience what, what game culture is. And they really were a part of establishing, you know, what that was. Okay. I can't really talk too, too much about what they're doing yet because we haven't really spoken about it, but okay. I, I will tell you it, 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 it an Atari, an Atari <laughs> hotel will be a place that I will take my children and any city that there will be one in, I will absolutely be staying at it because I'm yeah. so excited about it. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, we won't give away all too much, but I think it is uh, it's it's an exciting concept. Um, and if it's done right the right way, and I'm I'm certain when if you guys are involved, it will be. Uh, it, yeah, definitely the place to be. So you know, and, and let's hope let's see where the first one comes up here. Um, now, what else are you doing on the platform itself? Um, are you looking to stream oh, yes. content? Are you you know what 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 else are you looking to do on, on, from a digital point of view? 
Sure. Yeah. Look, our number our number one mandate at at um, at Subnation is to enhance the experience of the gamer through through content, through experiences, and through limited edition products. Um, and and so that's our number one uh, 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 kind of call to call to action. Um, and and so right now we're we're we've been creating. We started a, a television show with one of our partners, IMGN, um, uh, and and Try Hard. They're they're. It, uh, Instagram channel uh, a few years ago with Golden Boy, not well, actually last year with Golden Boy, where we started to create. We wanted to do surprise and delight, and and find gamers and and revamp their game caves. And so uh, we we it's a makeover show. Uh, it was really well received. Uh, Alex Golden Boy was just uh, an incredible uh, person to work with, um, and the show it, we're, we're gearing up for a second season right now, uh, and there's a lot of interest on that. So so we have a slate of programming that kind of fits into that category of mm. of 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 how we can make gamers' lives more interesting and better. Um, and, and so that will live, uh, in, in multiple different locations, um, uh, social and also linear and, and, uh, and, and digital. Um, so, so we're looking at many different places. We were just signed by UTA based on the, uh, the level of the content we have and the, and the interest, uh, we have there. We just actually signed a partnership with, uh, Neo, uh, one of the you know, great, great musician and, and, the, one of the judges of World of Dance with Jennifer Lopez, um, and Neo is kind of secretly been a, a, a gamer uh, for a very, very long time, and is an avid Street Fighter player. And uh, we've worked on a on a program with him that brings him together uh, in almost a, a celebrity style dancing with the stars uh, right. of of um, competition through through a fighting competition called Celebrity Fight Night, which uh, which which we're, which we're in the process of right yeah, now. I know Bruce has a like has his little fight. He started a fighting brand as well right at one point in time for what i remember from his stories yeah absolutely yeah bruce bruce actually seeded and funded and helped grow and develop the world series of fighting which was uh one of the competitors to ufc That's and right. then what i came into the office um one of the first things that we were working on was um we sold 60 percent of that to uh jimmy ivy and steve case ted leonsis don davis um, and Don, you know, Don Davis from Revolution Partners is another, you know, just a you know, genius of a guy. He and Pete Murray um, uh, and Carlos Silva at the time, uh, you know, had this uh, unbelievable concept to just to take that platform and and create, you know, not just, hey, I'm the world champion forever, but but make make a season out of it so that, you know, mm -hmm. hey, you're the world champion for 2018 or 19. And it's a and it's a tournament style competition. Best man wins in each category. Um, and that shows now on ESPN and uh, uh, we're really excited about that. We're still uh, uh, owners there, and, um, and and really love what Don and Pete Murray are doing um, w with the brand. Yeah, Bruce got his fingers everywhere, and and it almost looks like well, hopefully we'll be working together as well on, on one of the projects I'm involved as well. You know, Pan the Pangea Cup. You know what we call the the Shark Tanks meets uh, you know American Idol of game developers, which I think it's again we can't talk too much about it, but uh, it's an exciting project as well, which hopefully you guys uh, will help support us. Absolutely, I, I think it's a fantastic idea that you guys have there, and and we're absolutely you know in your corner and 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 here to help. Yeah, for sure. Now let's talk a bit about um, Big Block um, because it really, and, and we touched on it a few points already. It, it is, uh, you know, it's the holding company, but it has so many different elements to it, um, and obviously has a private capital or private equity part to it or, or venture part to it. Um, you know, what are some of the interesting things you guys are doing there, um, which you can talk about? Sure. Yeah. Um you know, our thesis really with the family office is to, you know, to reach the consumer, direct the consumer with content, experiences and products and and uh, just making their life better. It's the same thing thread that goes through everything we do. And, and really, you know, Doug uh, is a part of the family office uh, with me as well. And, you know, our our th our kind of plan is, is something he calls the five C's. We start with culture all the time. So we're subject matter experts in the cultures that we get into and the companies that we invest in. Um, and, and with that culture, you know, we make content experiences, IP that, that feeds into that culture. And, and when you, when you, when you do that at the highest level possible, that creates, you know, a conversation within a community 
and ultimately leads to commerce. And so the things that we're investing in there uh, and that we're focusing on right now is we have um, uh, Big Block LA, which um, is doing all the high-end uh, graphics packages, design, marketing work um, for you know major auto companies, Ford, Subaru, Chevy, uh, GMC, uh, as well as uh, – ESPN, NBA, MLB, NFL, FIFA, uh, PFL. As a matter of fact, as well, we, we, we just redid all their their graphic and branding for them. And then and then we have Subnation uh, in in the family office portfolio, focusing on this connection to the lifestyle and gaming. And mm-hmm. then we have a, a company which we seeded and founded um, called Surround Ventures. Um, kind of going back to my days at looking for emerging technology in Huntsville, Alabama. One one of the one of the hottest places in the world right now where, where some of the biggest unicorns have come out of is Israel. And uh, we, we found a, a, a truly brilliant young gentleman um, coming, you know, it is just coming out of college, Jared Cash. Um, and, and Jared had lived on a kibbutz in Israel and, and built some technologies off of some Israeli technology while he was still in college. And, um, and and Jared, you know, came in with us to uh, to build surround, and and really we started to make micro investments in emerging Israeli ad tech, and we've had yeah. some tremendous success there. And the, the the technologies that we're investing in, you know, align with sports technologies and media ad tech, and it really helps to keep us on you know head of the head of the curve. Um, uh, Randy Zuckerberg came in as a partner with us there. Yaron Kanjer, who's uh, you know one of the leading tech investors in Israel, uh, and and and. And Jackie Lowy uh, and and uh, th- this this company is really exciting. I, I think we're about to be one of the fastest growing uh, VC companies uh, in in about a month when we make an announcement. You know, in less than a year, uh, we're we're about to have our our, our first big exit, and um, we're super excited about that. That's yeah, yeah. It's called Surround Sound Ventures, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's so, cool. just 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 surround surround. Oh, VC. surround. All right. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Very interesting. And and the part I like is, I guess you know, you, as I said, you've come from being an artist, you know, in front of the stage there, you know, performing, to now, you know, shaping, you know, and music. You can see is somewhat a theme across your whole career. Um, but now you're really at, at the sort of you know intersection of of culture um, and between the different parts of cultures, how they, how they bring together. And I guess sub, that's what Sub Nation really is all about, right? Is just bringing all these pieces together. Yeah, it's, it's, Subnation is is really the the manifestation of of people's passions. Um, mm. And and right now, you know, uh, when, when there there are people who stand online every Saturday night, or at least they used to before COVID, um, to to get uh, you know limited a pair of sne- pair of sneakers. And sometimes they would walk in and and not even care what size it was because they were going to sell it the minute they walked out the door. Right? right. You have this entire comic book um, culture. Which you know turns into giant movies, and 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 the way that we listen and consume music, you know, these days, all of that is a part of 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 the culture that we touch. But we just touch it from, you know, what aspects of sneakers touch gaming culture, what aspects of comics touch gaming culture, what aspects of music filter into gaming culture, technology, and and really we're we're, we're delivering this this uh, you know, safe landing for the gamer and for brands. Uh, you know, they're, they're for, we're not an agency at Subnation, but we're a partner, and so we're, we're working with brands um, to, to to really have tremendous impact. Um, we know that brands' number one mandate is to sell products, right? If you want to sell products, why not go to a place where people's IP addresses are? But but you have to be very cautious in this environment, not to do things the way you know most of the agencies and folks were trained to do for so long and and really to understand you know millennial and gen z you, you, you've had to be in the trenches there with them and and sometimes you know people are coming in and so excited because they just got in a stream that had 20 million people and th- their brand was seen but they don't realize that on all the sub websites all the gamer sites they're being destroyed right because they didn't actually do it the right way and you really have to listen to that voice and so subnation really wants to be a champion of that voice and and we're also you know, uh, you know, I, I, I would love to think, you know, in, in my in my head that at some point, you know, we can follow that 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 line of what, you know, um, and I know this is a giant aspiration, but um, 
to to really be that Disney of esports. Right now, we're in the build stage of our of our business, um, and we're about to move into the buy stage of our business. You know, we've been building the right people, the right uh, reach into the verticals we want to be in, and um, and we really want to. We, we we feel there's going to be some consolidation in the marketplace, um, and and there's a lot of people coming out, especially during COVID. I'm seeing more and more and more and more companies come in that you know this is their pivot. And if you look at what's happening in esports, I mean, I think it took you know what twenty years to become a two billion dollar business that almost doubled during during covid you know I, the the rise of esports and gaming um right now and the amount of time people are spending in games is tremendous and i don't, know, I don't think we're going to really be going back to the live event aspect fully you know unless somebody comes up with some miracle cure that we don't know about right now that everybody you know believes in i think it's going to be 2022 before everybody's really feeling that level of comfort um and and so you know what's going to be happening in stream and in game is 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 crucial and how brands can communicate their message uh is going to be important and so what we've been doing is is you know we're about to start to unleash this this plethora of content uh and 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 digital experiences that that you know we've kind of been preparing for this moment and the great thing about you know being in the esports space and you know my 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 partner Ed Tomasi who's probably one of the most credible and and, and amazing human beings you know uh, just the, the relationships he has and the way that he goes about building businesses is just you're really special you know um but 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 Ed you know Ed, Ed built the very first land center in the United States. He worked for Samsung, um, and and he saw firsthand, you know, what that was like then. You know, you're talking like maybe 2000. I believe he he you know they hired Craig Levine when Craig was you know a teenager to, to work at the front desk. But then you know Craig and Han and 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 Ed started ESS, which was the very first first esports agency in the United States, which became ESL One, uh, which which became ESL North America, and so. You know uh, the 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 ability to really go far that be, that far that back and and really have those roots into the community globally is is crucial. You know you can't just kind of show up in the space, which I think a lot of people are doing right now, and sticking a flag in the ground. Um, and so we're 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 subject matter experts in in branding with Doug, you know, and music experiences and television with myself and 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 with you know esports, you know, with with Ed, and um, and all of us are, are in the technology space. And we've just been been you know, we just brought in Chris Mann, who's the CEO of uh, Ultimate Gaming, uh, one of the leading esports apparel companies, just came in as our CEO. COO, Carla Rizzo, who was one of the managing partners, um, who was overseeing E3 for many years, um, and also Alex Strasmore, who was who's over at FaZe Clan, um, have all recently just joined the team. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and something people, I always forget, you know, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Terry, uh, Terry Turok, um, you know, some people might know him. He was the game show host in 1990 for the Nintendo World Championship. Uh, which was an incredible wow. TV series that put together. And he sent me this video. It's hilarious, of course, if you think back how that probably would look at that time, right? But it was a it was a TV series already at that time focused on Nintendo games. And it was a world championship. There was prize money. It was, you know, different age gra- uh, categories uh, playing. If I'll send it to you. If you watch it, you're going, wow, that's that's 30 years ago, right? So we, we always make it sound like, you know, esports or e-gaming is a new thing. It's not really that new. It's been around for 30 years. It's probably longer than that. Um, and, uh, you know, but it is now maybe slowly coming into its own, right? Where it is truly becoming mainstream and recognized, not just as the sort of thing which you tell your kids don't do too much of it, right? I think there is a big change in that. And then we're all seeing this, uh, you know, every day, you know. Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 an absolute fabric. And in, in you look at, I have a three year old, right? And um, he picks up a book and tries to swipe it, right? I mean, <laughs> at, at, at at such an early age, you know, this is when he was younger, you know. Um, but but I mean, you know, he was eighteen months or however many months old he was. And and the thing is that the children are being born into technology in in a way that is just completely connected from birth. And and so that's the way that they see the world. And you know, it's really important that we're not just living in what's happening now, uh, but we're looking at what's happening next. And and that's what we're we're trying to do with everything that 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 we're involved in from Big Block Capital Group and Subnation and and Surround. Yeah, and I like the title Disney of Esports. I love that, uh, and I wish you all the best that you become that Disney of Esports. Uh, but before we wrap it up here, I have a couple more, uh, just sort of the usual um, questions I like asking, uh, and that is, you know, you've you've had a long career, and, and certain things worked, and some, as usual, didn't. Um, 
give, give me a couple of points uh, or, or uh, examples of things where you feel, wow, you know, uh, this is sort of a massive lesson. If and then if you were telling yourself you, 20 years ago, if you knew this, you would have done it differently. Or you know, if you're telling, talking to a, you know, someone coming out of college, what are some of the tips and tricks you would give them of your own career? What worked and what didn't work? Sure. You know, I, I think the more that you can educate yourself, it's really important to have, you know, great partners, but it's also really important for you yourself to understand what it is that you're involved with. Um, and uh, as, as a young, you know, futurist, you know, sometimes I, I would get myself a little bit ahead of the curve um, mm -hmm. early on in my career. Um, and, 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 and that would be a being at a place so far ahead of the curve that the market wasn't there for it yet, or or yeah. B, um, surrounding myself with other people who filled in gaps that I that I that I didn't really have the right subject matter expertise in, and mm. so I, I I feel like maybe early on I lost a few opportunities, but at the same time, you know. As a, as a young entrepreneur, someone getting into the space, you need those. You need your own failures. You know, as a parent, Absolutely. you can't just protect your kid from you know ne never falling down or getting hurt or getting their heart broken or whatever that might might be because those are the things that stimulate you the most. And I I think you know to to kind of really think about that you know from an artist perspective, you know the best songs, the best poetry, the best art, those things come out of sometimes pain. Right. Absolutely. And 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 out of, you know, look what's happening right now in COVID. You know, it's about really being innovative and, and taking those lessons that you learn. And, and, and sometimes your first idea might have been great, but it might have been, you know, went a half half yard. But it's out of the pain that you really come up with the solution. It's out of disruption that that we make, you know, great advances. I would totally agree with that. And, and I always say that I think I've learned a whole lot more out of my failures, um, you know, whether it was starting businesses or, or projects we got involved in where, you know, we got our fingers burned. Um, then probably when I was successful, you know, it, I would say maybe it's more fun if you're successful because that means you're making nice money. Um, and the, you know, when you fail, that means more mostly you burn money. Um, but yeah. the, lear the learning is the other way around. The learning is for sure on the other side of it. Uh, and you probably don't appreciate it. And you see when it happens at that moment in time, but uh, in, in hindsight, for sure. So I, I, it's interesting. I hear that all the time. You know, I think people do look at that that way in the right, in the right way. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. My, my wife has a, a podcast uh, called The Great Fail. And, oh, right. okay. and she, you know, she, she spent about 20 years in the public markets and she, she you know, she examines, you know, the, the failure of, of really legendary businesses. Right. And um, and it's interesting, you know, when, when you look at that through history, there's definitely a learning lesson from what you can take away uh, uh, from from because you can you can also have giant success and then lose it. Right. Absolutely. And the thing is to try and to try and avoid that. But that's very difficult in today's world, you know, based on Moore's law and, and the way that new technology is coming out. It used to be that you could have a business or an industry that would last, you know, a, a very long time. And now you really have to be open to reinvention. And you, if you want to have a successful business, you have to have one foot on, on the future. Absolutely. Yeah. You better reinvent yourself every six months or you're out of business in, in, <laughs> in 18 months later because someone will come there. That's for sure. Now and that, that sort of uh, nicely teased me up and, and I love that podcast. I'll go check it out. Uh, um, now, if you look at again, let's look a bit ahead. Um, you know, we, I would agree. We we all deal with this COVID uh, stuff for a year, another year to two, somewhere in that ballpark. I'm certain um, the world isn't going to go back to normal that quickly. Never mind the the economic fallout, which we all see. So, let's talk a bit about what you see in the next couple of years, but in the world of esports and sports, you know, and and how that all is going to merge. You know, you see athletes. Now having a little more time because they're not playing as much their regular sports, they get into esports, right? You see some big NBA players and others appearing there. And then what do you see after, right? Once the world does go back a bit more to normal and we have real events and things, you know, think about look a bit as a futurist, look a bit into the future for me here. Sure. Yeah, I I, I think you know, right now we are gonna see uh this continued uh kind of process of people staying at home and, you know, for most part, socially distancing. Uh, there, there are, of course, people who are still, you know, uh, rolling the dice out there. Um, but I think, you know, for, for any real brands to be involved in, in something where they're going to put large crowds together, they have to be very, very cautious. I think, you know, this is a, a responsibility that we have to have there. Um, 
and and so I, I think this 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 is actually a good moment. I think there's a lot of reflection going on in in the space. I think there's a lot of reflection going on in content. Um, and if COVID, you know, has 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 done anything, it's really accelerated the uh, erosion of many many things that were in disruption to begin with. Cable television, right? The way yep. brands spend their dollars, you know, uh, at 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 some of the more physical spaces. Uh, the way we think about you know giant boxes and malls and and the way people integrate and you know that was starting to change you know you you had you had really smart people who created concepts like the museum of ice cream which became you know such a socially virally instagrammable moment where the individual foot traffic was creating the marketing for for the space right those mm -hmm. things were already happening i think that you know we're going we're going to start to see more of a connection into a, a multiverse where we've got our physical and digital more connected i think you know brands celebrities sports franchises and and, and sports franchises teams content creators We'll be living in this hybrid world between what happens in a physical world and what happens in a digital world. Right. Um, and, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. I do believe that when we come out of it and, and right now, you know, again, you know, we're looking at things as strategic. You know, we had partnered with um, a company out of Ventura that that built a proprietary system for drive ins because drive in experiences even now were, were pretty terrible. You, you know, sit so, so far back in the row and they came up with a proprietary method for a 360 drive in and they've been having unbelievable experiences which they're rolling out oh, across yeah. the country. And 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 the, the reason I bring that up is if you look at their 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 events right now, they just had third eye blind play and and they've got these roaming cool. cameras and you see the kids in the cars. I mean, it's like they were let out of the house and they hadn't had air. <laughs> <laughs> for, for like a year and they got their first gasp of air, the passion, the excitement, the looks on their faces, the feeling of, oh, you know, I, I, I've got something to do, right? Mm -hmm. I think that we're going to come back with such a tremendous surge that the world is going to be celebrating together. And I think it's going to bring a, a, an even deeper appreciation for the live events and the experiences that we have. But what's not going to leave us is that that physical to digital that we're going to bring in. So how we're sitting in the stadium and how we're more connected to what's happening in the virtual world. We just spent the last, you know, 24 months, you know, sitting in how that is going to play a part into, into where we are. How are the reward systems and the, uh, the, 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 the way for a game to be gamified into physical real life. Right. And how is the commerce going to be playing in between those platforms that are happening? And, and how do I showcase my, my status and, and, and the things that I've gotten digitally, maybe I got a pair of digital Adidas sneakers and I've got the physical ones on my feet, right? You know, it's like, how are you showcasing your, your, your world and, and how are you living in it? I think that there are going to be multiple touch points there. Um, but I also think that, you know, there's going to be, you know, a continued erosion of a lot of what the, you know, these physical manifestations of, 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 of how real estate, you know, is right now. Right now we're working with one of the largest, I can't say which one yet, but one of the largest small developers in the world um, and looking at some of their pr premier property uh, to create this physical to digital transition. Uh, the other is that, you know, one of the things I'd like to see for the future and one of the things that we at Subnation are really, you know, um, dedicated to is that in some of these communities that don't have access to a ten thousand dollar PC or 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 you know the ability to some of the things that we have in other places to to bring steam not just stem but steam programs mm. into these markets because we do believe that the best gamers the best developers the best minds you know we we, we haven't been giving them the access to touch these things yet right. you know and and so I I I, I do see that we're we're going to see technology and we we you know I think that's gonna that's not going to happen on its own that's something that we as as influencers and 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 people you know it, it, that that are in that ecosystem ha have to have to make happen and I I think that's something that we really should be trying to get every kid in the world to be able to touch the right technology and learn how to how to how to work with it. Yeah. Wow, I love it. I have some very interesting thoughts there and um and definitely looking into the future. And and, and one part I, I always uh you know teach everyone here is that um you know and if you study psychology, you know, they basically they're they're the rules of uh anything between 30 days to somewhat 90 days, depends on who you listen to. Um it takes to form a new habit, right? So if you consistently do something for that period of time, you will <clears throat> turn it into more of a habit. And then whether it's, you know, trying to lose weight or do something else. 
Um, now we're not, you know, initially when this COVID thing started, we were in this sort of, yeah, it's going to be over in a couple of months and we're back to normal sort of thing. Well, we now know this isn't going to be the case, right? It's going to be coming off and on and, and, and all sort of, you know, rules are being constantly adjusted. So we're dealing with something which is going to be much longer, which means the new habits will be formed for sure. And that was, that means you go less to the mall because, you know, you're all buying it online. You're going to be more used to watching things in a digital world and in a, in a physical world. So that I do think, especially traditional sports, which is obviously the world I still spend more time in than maybe in, in the digital world yet in, or the e-world, e-sports world. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of pain there um, in, in the longer run. Um, and I think the sport, sports world has to learn from the e-sports world and others and really work together to, uh, to come back in the right way in whenever it is in a few years time. Uh, when we're hopefully can bring people back into these stadiums. So we'll all be part of this um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll be working together closely over in the next few years here or in the next few months here. So thanks for coming on here. Um, it's, I know it was really early for you. So I really appreciate that uh, getting up so early there in, in LA and uh, have a great Friday ahead of you. Um, I'm done here on my part of the world and uh, I guess we'll talk again soon. Yeah, thank thank you so much for having me. It was really great to talk to you. And uh, you may want to erase the first ten minutes. I haven't finished my coffee yet, so uh, <laughs> I, no, hope, no, no, I hope no. I didn't stutter too much. But uh, thank you very much for having me. You're doing a great job, and and uh, have a great night's sleep. Thank you, Seven. Enjoyed it. Talk to you soon. Take care, my friend. Bye bye. Bye bye. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Luer Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Luer. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.